Welcome to the Arena Decklist Podcast. I'm Jerry Thompson, joined by Brian Gottlieb, lover of panoramas. And we're going to talk about some standard. We have first decklist in from Kamigawa Neon Dynasty. However, I think we got some news to take care of at the top of the show. I'm going to be uh, selfish and greedy and start with my stuff first. So last week, we recorded the podcast live on twitch.tv slash arena decklist. Yay, us. Good job, us. We we're going to do it again this week, but then we didn't because... Boo, I'm, us. Boo. Boo. But also the expected outcome, let's be honest. Uh, I'm in the middle of moving, and our SCG stuff is coming to an end pretty soon, which means I have to figure out uh, you know, other ways to make money. So I'm kind of like ramping up content production on, I guess, like the Patreon side of things, but like the website side of things, arenadeckless.gg. Also, someone told me to buy the .com domain and redirect. So I did that too. So Ooh, smart. Good business thing. Yep. Yep. Uh, it was like, I don't know, 12 bucks for a hundred years or something. So go, go us. Anyway, website, probably going to be a lot of content, uh, or at least more than you're used to starting in March. And I've been trying to catch up on the weeks that I missed at various times in SCG. So did two articles this week in addition to basically trying to like start this other job while also trying to move. I got my keys yesterday. That's kind of dope. So yeah, busy as hell and my place is a mess. I'm a mess. I just, I, I didn't want to record, man. I just didn't want to, but hopefully next week I'll be all moved into the spot and we can just do it live every week if you want to. I will be there for you live with bells on. Uh, maybe not with bells on. I, I will be there though. I think people enjoyed seeing our ugly faces. I don't. I don't know did why. They? Yeah, pe- people said they did. I don't know why. I mean, I, I don't know. I I engage with podcasts in like a very odd fashion. I think I, a lot of it is connection to the people doing the podcast, and I think some people find when you're watching us put forth our arguments, it's a little bit easier. Also, I know a lot of people. You know, we were doing a top ten list. People remarked that having the cards up on screen over on either Twitch or YouTube. Uh, it was very helpful to them. Yeah. So I mean that's, that that's, that's cool. I get that. That's why I did the work, you know, yeah. and and set up the the slides and everything. I think now that I've gone through and done it, it's going to it's be easier. Yeah, it's gonna be easier going forward. So that's cool. I, I I do think that we could do that probably for every sort of top ten show. I don't think that, you know, that's out of the realm of possibilities for the preview shows. I think it would probably be more valuable, but also if we talk about like 30 cards in an episode, I just, I don't think it's particularly viable unless you want me to just like scroll through Scryfall or whatever on, on the stream. I don't know. Yeah. Maybe, maybe that's what we'll do is we'll just put up whatever website we're using as we scroll around. It won't be quite as pretty, but we'll still get the job done just as effectively. I, I think we tend to freewheel it during preview season and just kind of let conversation take us around different cards. So it's harder to do the prep work and have like a nice clean outline like we did for our top 10 list. Yeah. And I also put some new emotes on the Twitch channel. Oh, very exciting. So you're you're like a real online person these days, dude, very legitimate, not by choice, really. (laughs) I mean, (laughs) if I had my way, I would just be still staring at the wall, I guess. But like, this has been kind of nice. It like I, I needed something to motivate me. And this is obviously not like the best circumstances or anything, but uh, I like feeling like this. I like feeling motivated. I like having a reason to like get up in the morning. Like th- there have been a couple days this week where I've, I've woken up and just like immediately left the house. Cause I was like, I, I just have to get shit done, you know? And it has not felt like that in a very long time. No, I feel that that's, that's good. I'm glad you're finding that little bit of fire. Yeah. Let me ask a question. I'm going to ask you to assign some percentages. How how much of like your your vigor right now is just drawn of sort of uncertainty, desperation, like changing circumstances, and how much of it is maybe not directly like forced by, but helped by the fact that I, I think you're ing- legitimately enjoying this set, Kamigawa and Neon, Neon Dynasty. It seems like you are into it. It seems like you really like a lot of the cards. Uh, it seems like you believe in its potential to change metagames. So uh, is, is that influencing your excitement too? That helps. But I, I feel like if it, if I were not writing about standard, maybe I'd be writing about modern or something, you know, like I can usually find something to be excited about in, in Magic. So I, I think it is 
uh, fight or flight or I'm in, you know, survival mode type of stuff. And I, I have like major, major executive dysfunction issues where, if you don't know what that is, Google it because I'm, I'm sure, especially in like the gaming sphere, uh, you almost certainly know someone who who has like a lack of this, right? Basically, I need like a deadline and I need there to be consequences for me to get going and to do stuff. And now it's just like, well, I am out of my house at the end of March, no matter what I do. So that means that clock is ticking and I need to solidify something, right? And uh, kind of... Similarly, is like end of February, I'm out of SCG, right? And I need to figure out a way to pay rent and all that stuff. So the fact that there there is a, a deadline looming means that it's time for me to do stuff. And it would be harder to do stuff uh, magic related if things were not interesting. But it, it, it's it's got to be like 80-20 like deadline, you know? Okay. Fair distribution. I I obviously have a lot of the same issues when it comes to finding drive, but ultimately if I am not excited about the thing I'm doing, no amount of like fear and uncertainty can overcome. I'll just, I'll just crumble. That's fine. I'll, I've crumbled before. I'll crumble again. So if there isn't like that pure interest and joy in something, it, it's not coming no matter what. And uh, this this set has done a lot to have me inspired to write, share my opinions, talk about it, and just find like a good way to engage with it. So it's it's been nice to see. Yeah, it's it's interesting. I've found that I am way more likely to be able to do stuff if there's someone else involved mm-hmm. because the person might not care, but I care that I feel like I am beholden to that person. So. I don't know. I guess an example would be like my my partner visited for the first time in a year and a half or whatever, maybe even more uh, around December. And it was like so much easier to just like get up, make breakfast, like, you know, clean my place, whatever, than if I were just here living alone. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, man, I, I feel like if I were you in your situation with your wife, things would be different. You know, like I I would just like not be able to crumble in that situation because there's like more than one person around. I will say that it prevents me from the full crumble a lot of the time. It is this thing where you can go up to the precipice, but you ultimately know like you have to provide and support this person. Right. So that's what pulls me back. But those those minor crumbles, it's weird because in a lot of ways, you're sort of supported in doing that because you know that person has your back unconditionally, right? Like, I I, I don't fear her, like, getting mad at me or being disappointed yeah. in me. I, I know that she understands where I'm coming from and knows, like, the things I go through. So it, in some ways, perpetuates them, I guess. I, I don't know if perpetuates the, is quite the right word, but it doesn't reach the level of emergency as early as maybe it should, you know? Yeah, I feel like you are probably more emotionally mature in that regard than I am, where it's like, I I feel the same way. Like, logically, I know that that would probably not happen. But mentally, I'm just like, I still can't allow that to happen. Yeah. Uh, so whatever. I mean, I, I think it's like a net good thing if that is a motivator for me, even if it's just like, I don't know, kind of silly. Or you know, what's funny, though, is that a, a lot of what I'm presenting now is the way I handle this is post mood stabilizers is very different from my pre mood stabilizer yeah. life where I did let like that anxiety just consume me. And I, I look at it even in terms of like, you know, fitness and exercise and how when I was exercising a lot of the time, it wasn't so much that like I knew this was the right thing to do. It's that my brain was eating itself from the inside, forcing me to do these things. And now that like I'm in a little bit, I would say healthier mental place. It doesn't drive me to do some of those same behaviors that I had previously. And it can be both a positive and a negative. It's really weird like that. Yeah. There was, there was a period when I moved back to Washington state, probably, I guess like 2017, 2018, where I had a buddy of mine who started like hardcore going to the gym and, you know, like lost, lost some weight, put on some muscle, was like looking really, really good. And he was just like, you know, you should just like come to the gym with me. And it'll be good to like hang out definitely like outside of magic events and everything. We'll just like whip you into shape because he just like studied a bunch and and knew his stuff. Right. It was like having a free personal trainer basically. Mm -hmm. And 
I like this company too, you know? So I went like two or three days a week. There were some days that I canceled for sure. Whereas like, you know, my sleep schedule didn't cooperate or whatever. And I went because he was there. And then it, it was generally like pretty early in the morning for me, like, you know, 9 a.m. type of stuff. Or I think like 10 a.m. probably had to get up at 9. And this is with me going to sleep at like 6 a.m. on the rig, you know? Right. So it's just like really bad time for me. But most of the time I was able to like get up, go to the gym. And the rest of the day after that, I always felt awesome. Yep. Because I just, I had like gotten out of the house. I had interacted with humans. I had done the exercising and I just was like so much more awake, alert, had energy, whatever. But my brain could never convince me that like going to work out was a good thing. Right. It takes a long time. Yeah. So uh, I, I never, I never got to that place. And then eventually it was just like, well, you know, I missed last week and now it becomes easier to miss this week. And just like, eventually I stopped going and like he kept going, you know, he's, he's just an Adonis now. But similarly, I think things happened to us in, in the pandemic where we would like skip an SCG article because mm -hmm. of, of our mental. And then it just became easier to skip uh, in other weeks, you know, and I tried to not make it more than like, you know, skipping once per month or whatever. And some of them I made up doubling up on certain weeks and some I didn't or whatever, but it's, it's just, a, it was such a bad precedent to set, set, you know? So now I'm like, okay, can I, can I double up twice this week to get paid because I missed some during like December and January and Cedric's accommodating, you know? So that's cool, but it's also like, damn, this is the worst possible time. I wish I would have just not taken the week off. <laughs> right, right. Why do I self-sabotage all the time? Well, it's a fair question and one that I will almost certainly never have the answer to. Dude, it's just my, it's my MO. Yeah, I feel that. Well, I, I'm enjoying this 10 minutes of mental health check-in at the start of every episode. I feel like even if we lost every single person who listened to our show, it'd probably still be net positive for us to do it this would, at the start man. of every show. It would, for sure. I just need to, you know, if someone can trick me into going to the gym, or I guess like going to a gym is probably a bad idea, but like exercising. I mean, I have, I have enough like weights and mats and stuff around this place where I, I could do some sort of exercise routine here. And I, I've definitely thought about that. It was like, oh, you know, I'm just home all the time. I could almost certainly do this and I just never do. Yeah. So. What else are you doing? That's the question. Like I ask myself all the time, like, what exactly am I doing where I don't feel like I have time for this? That I, I have no, no answer I, for you. I have time. Yeah. It's, it's gotta exist. I mean, there's, there's no, almost no external pressures on me. So it seems like I should be able to make this happen. Maybe not this week, you know, but basically every other week for the last couple of years I've had time. Interesting. Interesting how our brains work. Look, man, they just want me to open the loot crate. That's all my brain wants me to do. A lot of a lot of booster opening going on. That's all you get constantly. Yeah, that I used to get that with magic. I don't anymore, though, because now I'm just like, well, if, if I want the card, I can just borrow it or buy it or whatever. Yeah, there's there's something that has changed about opening magic packs for me as well. Uh, I used to every time I went to the whatever store I would go to Walmart target, always buy myself a booster. And I, I always appreciated the experience of just like opening one booster for no reason. I enjoyed it. It's just a routine. I, I don't do it anymore. I don't, I don't know. It just doesn't hit me the same way. I remember I spent like the only $4 I had on a pack of Mercadian masks when our gas station, our local gas station finally got it in. It said it's God awful. Right. So mm. it's like, obviously I wasn't going to open any good cards. Even if I opened a port, I probably would have just you know sold it for a nickel or something. But I opened up Battle Squadron. I, just, I, don't, I don't know Battle Squadron offhand. I'm, I'm sure there's a reason for that. It's a five mana red creature that probably has no text. Right. You know, and things things were just different. You know, it's like, oh, man, this is the only four dollars I have. Better get something good. And I'm also just buying a set where there are no winners. Yeah, <laughs> you, like, can't, you can't possibly come out ahead. But I don't know that, you know. And yeah, there, there was a rush to that, right? Yeah. yeah but, I used to buy packs of Fallen Empires. Like, I, I get it. You somehow trick yourself into thinking it matters. Not anymore, buddy. No. I could buy 100 Battle Squadrons with that, <laughs> with that $4 now. So. You could swim in Battle Squadrons if that's what you wanted. Anyway, second piece of news. God, I don't even really want to talk about this, man. Uh, there is... I'm, I'm going to paraphrase and probably get some stuff wrong. If you want more info, Cedric Phillips did a pretty decent write-up of this on Twitter, but there is like a hedge fund that owns a 2.5% stake in Hasbro 
that is like trying to get the, it, it reads like, you know, like a world's protest for me. They're just like, <laughs> the arena economy is bad and there's not multiplayer or spectating and you're killing organized play and stuff. And it's just like, I, I don't really understand what's going on. <laughs> they're saying words that I like, but I know that they're not my friend. I think that's a good read. That's a, that's very astute. They could be motivated by similar reasons as you. I I think they could be genuine in their motivations, but I think identifying them as not your friend is probably a smart call. Here's what I want to say about this. I would say when it comes to matters of this nature, things with like surrounding corporate boards and you know investor activism situations, I would say I probably know more than like 99.9% of the people in the world. And that's that's not a boast. I'm not proud of that fact. It's just like I went through law school and then I worked in environments that were very, very adjacent to this type of stuff. And it influenced my work regularly. Despite that fact, I will tell you that I don't know enough to really get all the motivations here and to understand exactly what's going on. And I'm not sure anyone does. But I do know that for me personally, this news did zero to excite or to let me believe that any kind of changes are forthcoming. That's what that's what I took away from it. So yeah. I think it's safely ignorable is what I would actually say. And the fact that it's not being ignored is a win for the people doing it. So they have the stake in Hasbro, which means that they basically get listened to if they have a grievance or whatever is like kind of my understanding. So it's like now they're making these demands and trying to get these things to happen. And some of the stuff that they're saying are definitely things that resonate with the player base. Yep. But this is like, you know, you get the email from the Nigerian prince or whatever, and you're just like, I don't know what the scam's going to end up being or whatever, but I feel like this is not for me, you know? And I, I, I don't know that it's like a scam or what they're trying to do exactly or whatever, but it's just like, it just kind of like rubs me the wrong way that it seems like it's supposed to be like altruistic or whatever, you know, right. for, for the good of magic or whatever. And it's like, no, obviously like you care about money or like, them splitting off wizards for some reason or whatever it is. I don't know. I don't know what game you're playing, but I'm not going to participate. Good read. I, I, I don't, there's no part of me that thinks this is like a hard scam. That's not what's, what's happening. Here. Yeah. I don't, I don't think it's a scam. Either. It's just like you, you read the words and you're like, Oh, this, this sounds like it could be beneficial for me. You know, like maybe, maybe I'll like spread the word or see how I can help or what, you know, it's just like, nah, just probably don't do that. Just like, don't get involved. Let let them handle it how they're going to handle it. See what the outcome is. That's it. Yeah, zero percent excited. Yeah, that's just where I'm at. It is interesting and is weird. And I don't know. They they have like Finkel on their board or whatever. It's like I I don't understand what's going on here. This well, no, they're they're going to propose him or, as, yeah, yeah. as a potential board member, which in and of itself it just doesn't mean a whole bunch. Like it it. it there, there's a lot more ground you have to cover before any of this matters. And I. Yeah. So think, they, they had a list of five people that they would propose would be the board if it came to that. Right. That's what it was. I, I think they were proposed board members, not that they were going to be the entirety of the board. Yeah, but again, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I don't know that with certainty. I, I skimmed. <laughs> if there's one thing it's weird. I it's don't want to read again in detail, it's shit like this. So I skimmed yeah. very quickly. And like I said, even thinking I probably know a lot about this, a lot more about the stuff than the average person, I I don't know exactly all the tenets of their proposals. So. Uh, yeah. So I just just ignore it. If, if stuff happens, you'll hear about it. You know, Good approach. I don't even know how this got spread so much uh, today. And like... It's one of those things where, like, we're only talking about it because it already got spread. So I don't think that we're helping to perpetuate the spread or anything. No. Because if, if that were the case, we would just not talk about it. But yeah, I just saw people retweeting it in my Twitter feed. That's where it you came from for me. And you don't don't do that. Don't don't worry about it. There is there is good good selective use of that retweet button is what I like to practice. I'll I'll drop Same. it. I'll, I'll give you a retweet every now and then, but Same. I I want to be very purposeful about it. So. Yeah, same. Uh, all right. 
Well, that's the show. Thanks for joining yep, us this their week. And- game. Uh, there, there have been some Magic Online events. There have been, you know, some arena ladders. I have been playing. My queue times have not been great, but I guess that's kind of the problem with everyone. It might not necessarily just be a standard thing. You go queue times are less than two seconds. Continue. Oh my god! I remember when like arena was late. Like you hit, you hit play, and boom, there's another person. Yeah, I, I'm up to I'm up to the the platinum level now. So I I am I've experienced all levels of the Yu-Gi-Oh ladder and your game your matchmaking is instantaneous. Okay. Is is platinum better than Arena's platinum? No. Okay. Yes. Yes, it probably is. Like uh, something like 15% of the player base has reached platinum. So it's it's not like it's platinum 1 is like the equivalent of mythic. That's as high as you can get uh, on their ladder. So Interesting. Okay. Yeah. I I am not a platinum 1 player yet. I okay. still don't know how most of my cards work. Word. I, I was going to say, I just hit platinum in arena after starting from Bronx. Congratulations. Nice. No big deal. Yeah. yeah. And so there have been some events on, on Magic Online, right? These challenges, there have been a couple leagues. The leagues have been sparse, but that has been kind of the case with Standard. And also, it's weird when a new set comes out because uh, some of the cards are just like pretty hard to get and are very, very bloated. And you should probably not buy them directly until more of the set gets open and the prices go down and everything. And because of that, it's also difficult for like the bots to stock them right away. So I had some folks ask whether or not they should just, you know, try and play standard on Magic Online, at least like utilize whatever rental service they have to try and play standard there instead of like also spending on Arena. And I think that that's a good idea if it works out. I'm just not sure if it's going to because the challenge is fire, but like, the premieres don't or the preliminaries and it doesn't seem like there are a lot of people playing in the leagues because not a lot of five O's get posted. And there's the issue of like the win trading stuff that's happening. So I don't know if it's time for folks to get in and try playing standard on magic online. I, I swear I will at some point once all this crap settles down, just, just to kind of like test the waters and see how it feels, you know, but Certainly for the challenges, folks show up and they usually bring their best. Uh, We've seen a lot of the standard innovation happen like in these challenges in the last three months. And a lot of it, I think, is like stuff that people are not aware of. Did you see my tweet about Arena? I know you often miss my tweets, so you you may not have seen this. Man, I just have not been really online. I will check. Okay. I I can give you the quick summation. Doing some, some finances recently and looking at my expenditures... And oh, in 20, 872. $872 on Arena in 2021. That number is uh, only representative. And this is by choice. So I, I just want to make that clear. Only playing ladder. I could play a, Arena Opens. I don't. So there's no, there's, no, there's no losing or winning on that number. Like it's just not part of the equation. It's just what I use as a tool to go ahead and hop on ladder and test. So I can't possibly make any return on that $872 investment I use to play Arena. Do you think I am getting a good deal for my money? No. Me neither. Me neither. And I, I think something has to change. And I have to approach this program very differently. And I, I think I'm ready to. I, I understand all your criticisms about Standard on Magic Online. And I... I think they are correct and fair, and it may not quite be in that place yet, but I, it's it's just not reasonable to ask for that type of expenditure. And also, I think we haven't actually spoken about this. I think we've made up our minds as content creators that we're done with alchemy. Is that correct? Am I putting words in your mouth right now? I, I would like to be done with it, but I also want to provide content that is relevant to folks. So- I know, but is it, is it relevant to fo- Like, I haven't heard someone mention alchemy in forever and like you you know i was on board with the idea and like trying to champion it but the caveat i said was it had to be a heavily heavily engaged with format not only by the player base but by wizards itself and i just don't think they've lived up to that i think there needed to be a different level of communication that they were providing not just your nerfs and buffs article of which we've had two now and you know, a bunch of which invalidated many of my cards in both Alchemy and Historic. And <laughs> I'm 
I'm done with it. I, it just doesn't work. They did not deliver on what I hoped they would. So I would like to check out. So um, Al- Alchemy, Historic, uh, although I think Historic does a better job being evergreen, but like al- also now standard to a degree, these are becoming formats that are like old extended or block constructed where it's like there's never a reason to play them unless there's a qualifier coming up. Right. And there's not a one size fits all like qualifier season where back in the day it was like you would have a qualifier season of like limited of block constructed of extended and of standard. And for three months, that was all anyone did was play those formats. Like you go to a GP, it's that format. You go to a BTQ, it's that format. Everyone was participating in the same stuff. And then you had things like FNM that lasted all year long and were usually standard until they started branching those out. Right. So it's like, Standard was kind of evergreen at that point. Everyone played a format, super hardcore for the three months, and then moved on to the next thing. And that's how I feel about Standard and Alchemy. And I guess like Historic probably got beat up a little bit by the Alchemy stuff where people stopped playing it a little bit. But like, I don't know. It seemed like people were consistently playing Historic uh, for the last six to 12 months, maybe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And... You know, before that, everyone was playing standard all the time because that that's what was there. Now that's kind of like modern, just like people play modern like all the time just for funsies because that's what they do. Here's the problem, though, with with that analogy is that there there were those three months periods where everyone focused on that thing. What's making people focus on this thing now? Like qualifier weekends are supposed to do all the lifting for it. The one off qualifier weekends where I'm supposed to dump a ludicrous amount of gems to be able to build whatever deck is going to get invalidated the week after the qualifier. Is it the, no be, dude, you've played in those qualifiers or like the opens or whatever. It's like people aren't showing up with like the best deck in the format. A lot of the times they're showing up with what they have. And if you played historic six months ago and you try to get into historic now, yeah, the format's different, but with what you have, if you have like a reasonable historic deck, you could probably use that to build and play something something else you know it's like you're not 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 everyone plays the the best deck or the deck that's best for them it's like the deck that is best for them given the contents of their account and their budget but there's no content to make for those people you know what i mean like that's that's not i I don't know what you're supposed to say other than play your cards that's fair as far as like telling them what to play but as far as like catching them up on the format and helping them understand what to expect it does it does matter right and i think that if there is a qualifier coming up that, you know, say is alchemy. And now that is what the conversation is, or say when the neon dynasty alchemy stuff drops, that is what the conversation is going to be the majority of it. And at that point, joining the conversation also makes sense. So I I just question the ability of, these things to actually become the conversation anymore, but maybe that's just my own biases. And maybe like, I feel less connected to that conversation. So I'm just Im- imputing that on everyone else. It's I, not actually true for a lot, for a lot of the stuff that we're talking about. I feel like I don't even want to have the conversation. I think it's not useful for other people to have the conversation. I think we should probably just shut it down. But at the same time, we're not making content for us. We're trying to make content for of something, course. something that appeals to a broader audience. Right? So yep. when there is an alchemy qualifier on the weekend, you know, hopefully we're going to be talking about that format. That's just how, how it's going to be. And that's how it's been basically the entirety of the podcast. Right. Because we did that with like SCG tour events and grand prix and stuff like that, where it was like, okay, well this weekend, you know, there's a standard SCG tour, but there's a modern magic online PTQ and there's like a pioneer GP in Europe or whatever. And we tried to kind of like spread that stuff out. Uh, and just like devote the topic to who it was most relevant for. And I, th- I think that that should still stay the same, even though that number of people that it's relevant for are shrinking. Interesting way of looking at things. Yeah, I, I don't have the answer. I just know that like from a like a, a Google Trends type analysis. Yeah. And and just an anecdotal Google tw- Trends analysis at that, just me being involved with community and seeing what people are talking about. People just aren't talking about these things right now. So I don't, I don't know what to do with that information. I, I Dude, I agree with you. And so like, again, back in the day where I was like, okay, there's like GP PTQ or GP online PTQ and SCG event that are three different formats on a weekend, right? And we would try and figure out how to talk about that. And normally it was like, well, 
The majority of our listeners are in the U.S. Even if they're not going to the the Open, maybe they're going to be watching it. So they want to be like kind of caught up on the format Mm -hmm. and know what's going on. So it's just like, okay, we'll talk majorly about standard and then maybe check in on like the other stuff or like give recommendations on what to play and, and things like that. I think that if in those instances, the SCG tour event was like 70% of what we should be talking, talking about now it's like, I don't know, all of them are like 20% and then we're supposed to spend like 40% talking about mental health and hedge funds, you know, like <laughs> who knows, who cares? Yep. I, I don't know what to say to that. I, so I mean, like, that's I, I, I that's I how we've allocated our time and I there's a reason for it, kind of. I understand what you're saying, man. I, I do. And like, this is definitely a thing that I want to solve going forward. I actually, remind me, I have a reasonable idea to run past you. Oh, okay. Good. You've uh, solved it already. A, a couple of reasonable ideas, actually. I've been, dude, I've been working over here. You have no idea. Hustling. Yeah. See, I, I don't know. We got to figure it out going forward. And it, it's weird because I wish that I could just be like, what what content would you click on? And, and just ask people, but people lie and they, they don't do it on purpose. Right. But it's just like, whenever you ask someone like, Oh, you know, like what would you like to see me stream or what type of article would you be more likely to click on? It's like, they tell you, and then they just don't click on it anyway, you know, or you do something that they hadn't thought of. And then they do click on it because it had like a catchy title or right. was, was out of the box or, or whatever. You know, so it's just so weird. It's like you can't really get direct feedback. It's like we just have to throw things at the wall and see what sticks. Yes. While also constantly be adapting. Yep. Tricky. Yeah. So, I mean, that that's that's our life right now. Would it would it be so easy that like every week there was a standard SEG tour event? We just covered standard every week and like the format was good. You know, like those those were good years, but we don't have those years. Oh, they, were, they were really, really good. It's so funny, too, <laughs> that you mentioned that. And I see folks like Todd doing a really good job just going back and watching old events. And people are showing up and hanging out with him to do that and really appreciate it. Yeah, I've and been it's, watching them. It's, it's wild. It's it's a good idea because people are hungry for that kind of stuff. Yeah. Uh, okay. So these challenges, right? Uh, I don't know if it's a good time to get invested in standard on Magic Online. But I will investigate and I will get back to you. I promise. Okay, good. I'm looking forward to hopefully getting a yes on that. Same. Uh, anyway, both these standard challenges were won by the same player with the same deck. And uh, if you go and look at these challenges, they are from February 13th and February 14th. Yep. It is currently broken the way that they export them so that all the new cards show up in this other category rather than being dispersed in throughout the deck list. Which kind is, of useful. I, I kind of like it during week one. But. During during week one, it's not bad, but it's also drawing to like look at a deck and be like, why is this 20 card? Oh, there's 40 in the other category, right? Yes. Uh, but for the winning deck list, it's very relevant that there is no other category. O underscore Daniel Lacos won both events with Is It, uh, four Gold Span Dragon, two Hall Breaker Horrors, bunch of controlling cards, zero new cards. Won both tournaments. I... <laughs> I, I don't want this to be the case. I want to believe that there is an element of lag and lack of sort of comfort with a lot of the new ideas that are circulating, of which there are many, and of which I think many are good. I have had a lot of success uh, on Arena Ladder, so it's meaningless, but it feels, these decks feel real. The things I've been working on feel very real to me. I think there is potential there. And to see a zero new card is it deck built around Goldspan Dragon and Hole Breaker freaking horror is just is my that card abs- good? Uh, turns out it's decent. And if you want to make an argument that like this is actually a deck on the back of Goldspan Dragon, I understand that argument. And you're not wrong in saying that. Like Goldspan Dragon is an incredible magic card. It's just one that could probably be adapted to much easier than Holbreaker Horror, which now the only card that could potentially prey on it is also banned from the format. So is it is it possible that this is just like the best thing to be doing and it invalidates anything else you're going to try? It wouldn't shock me. Here's the reason why I didn't think that was true in my own experience. There's a lot of really good ways to go wide, get small amounts of value from like all of your cards. Holebreaker Horror doesn't play great into those scenarios. It's never bad. Don't get me wrong. Like it's it's very hard for Holebreaker Horror to fail. But when all of your spells cost one mana, when you generate battlefield presence quickly, where you get very wide and aren't, you know, just super vulnerable to having your one 
five or six mana threat reset, then there is some potential to play through Holebreaker Horror. And I think of things like Oni Cult Anvil decks and more artifact based things around Moonveil Prototype and just more aggressive takes on, on Red in particular. I think all of those things do sort of line up well against Holebreaker Horror. To a point, because you can build the rest of the deck to account for those things. And we we see that here, right? Like there's five, really good five sweepers in the main deck. Yeah, really good anti-aggro tools aware of the weaknesses you have. And if you can shore up those weaknesses with these very pointed cards and then use Holebreaker Horror to overcome literally everything else, like every other expensive spell you could possibly play, then things could stagnate. And it's why I would have taken this card out with the last set of bannings. It was the one card that like I just didn't think you can make a justifiable case for it remaining in standard and standard being better for its inclusion. There's almost no way standard is a better format with Hullbreaker Horror present. So this result, it's it scares the shit out of me. Like I, I am worried. There's every incentive in week one to try new stuff, right? Like you want to be the person who yes is no. known for breaking it. Yes and no, because stuff is very expensive on Magic Online, and it's possible that Okay, yeah. It's possible that the the uh, rental services did not have new cards, right? Okay, but you, you scroll through the rest of this stuff. It's it's not all, is it? Like, it's, it's just not a widely represented deck until you get to the winner of both tournaments. Like, it wasn't like there was a lot of people just sleeving this up again. And, you know, is it there? Yes, absolutely. It's, it's present, but it's not a huge portion of the metagame whatsoever. And to see it win both events is just, like, it's really jarring. And I think it spells a problem for what next week's events will bring. Yeah. Uh, And I think that'll be the true test to see whether or not this is the real deal. But because of the lack of interest in standard, that also causes uh, the technology to be slower, right? The the Mm -hmm. adoption of it. Like people don't necessarily want to invest in stuff that they don't know is very good. And maybe the cards are super expensive on Magic Online and people are uh, certainly like wild cards starved on Arena, I, I definitely made like a pointed effort to only work on certain things. And there, yes. are, there are other decks that I have ideas for where it's like, ah, do I want to do like, you know, four Wanderers just for like this deck or whatever? And it's like, no, I don't. So I don't know. I, I think that th- these are all real things that you need to take into consideration that, that could be affecting things. Also, both the challenges were only six rounds, which is pretty light. So they're... Fair. Yeah. There wasn't there there weren't a ton of people in these events, which doesn't necessarily speak to whether or not is it's good or bad. Just that you know, normally I would expect them to be like seven rounds, at, at least like most of the time. Yeah, well, the Izzet deck played nine rounds, so it's, I know. it's got it's got eighteen hits to uh, sort of justify. Also, uh, I believe yeah, number one seed in in both events. I I think that still holds, or they just like reset that afterwards based on. No, uh, that, where they finish in the tournament. So, uh, so up top is their their final finish. I think if you, okay. if you scroll all the way to the if bottom, I, if I look at the bracket where it's like seated one through eight, you're saying that's based on their final finish. Yes. Okay, that's incredibly dumb. But uh, looking at it, I I think you are correct. Scroll the very bottom. Um, uh, wait, that doesn't actually play. I'm I'm looking at whatever. I'll scroll to the bottom. No, it is it is their final finish at least for the the first four. But yeah, scroll to the bottom. You can see their standings after Swiss. Yep. Yep, I see it now. Okay, so uh, five and one for O, Daniel Akos in one Swiss. And in the other Swiss, we are looking at a, another five and one. Yeah, and, and se- second seed in that one behind the 6 Yep, so a uh, total of 16 and two on the weekend, I believe is what we're looking at there. Yes. Pretty good. It is very good. Uh, it looks like standings from the first event – he was the bottom of the five and ones. So likely lost round one or just, you know, played against a bunch of people who like lost all the rounds after they played yep. game win percentage, 77% uh, for the first one. Yeah. Which I don't know. You're cutting up the loser bracket potentially. And then in the second one was like 60, 68 or something. 68. Yeah. Yeah. Still very high, but yeah. But higher than, higher than, normal i would say you know it's like if you get like low 60s or something like that's that's pretty understandable yep so i don't know just like looking at things like that but th- this one daniel Lacos was the the highest of the five ones so like you know probably just won a bunch and then maybe lost in the last round or skewed yep. the last round or whatever sure yeah totally possible so i certainly like a, a dominating performance also uh lucas Desec, who got second in the first standard challenge got ninth in the second one 
two two great performances from both those players. I mean, anytime you show up on week one with those kind of finishes, that's a really nice job identifying uh, the metagame and everything going on in it. Yeah, and I think both of them play standard a lot, or like they do very well in the challenges. Yep. All right, do you want to talk about is it anymore or is it just like a wait and see kind of thing? I, I think it's a wait and see. I, I think this is a very nice looking list. I don't have any gripes or changes that I would suggest. I I would be prepared to see more of this going forward. Uh, second place in the first challenge, Lucas Tasek, like I mentioned, uh, does very well in the challenges, is one of the, the people like doing a lot of innovating too, it looks like. And... There's this Orzov deck that, like, was Esper, has been Esper, uh, that is kind of, you know, shambling gas, deadly dispute, meat hook massacre type of stuff, right? Mm-hmm. With the, I, I guess it's like Edgar and more of the learned stuff, the lesson learned stuff, Professor of Symbology. And then that deck has just been evolving over time. And I've seen some newer versions with the Ninja Planeswalker. Yep. Forget his name. Um, but this one is just Orzov, only four new cards, two Igonjos, two Ow, the Dawn Skies, Professor of Symbology, Shambling Ghast. No eye twitch, no uh deadly dispute actually in this one, but uh Rite of Oblivion as a sacrifice outlet, wedding announcement to help your little creatures go wide, welcoming vampire to draw some cards, some Sorens, some Walths, uh Meat Hook Massacres, like This shell is good, and it has a million different cards that you could play, right? Yeah. So I think you can benefit greatly from tuning your deck week to week to, you know, handle whatever other folks are doing, and this seems like a pretty good update. I I really like this deck. I really like Wedding Announcement, Rite of Oblivion stuff. I, I sort of think Rite of Oblivion was one of the turning points for this archetype when I really came on board with it, where... You needed that second source of just I will I will grind through whatever you do, and the fact that you have a hard removal spell coming out of your graveyard is it's a lot. It's a lot for these decks to force through, especially when you already have really good card advantage engines present in your deck. Like it's just not hard for you to generate a lot of advantage as your deck stands now. So I I'm into this archetype. The one thing I am going to say is that when I didn't believe in this deck in standard, it was mostly because I just didn't understand how it existed in a world of Aloran's Epiphany. Same. Divide by zero stuff. So that is gone. The whole Breaker Horror endgame is still there. There, Ultimately, this deck loses to whole Breaker Horror in the finals. The... The problem is a slightly different one because like I said, this deck has a little bit more potential to go wide, but it's, it's not quite on the level of some of the other stuff I've seen around wedding announcements. Some of the stuff I've been doing where you do generate these large scale value engines with things like say Oni Cult Anvil and just are able to plink your opponent out, even in those scenarios where they do establish their Hullbreaker Horror. I think this deck is a little bit more vulnerable because you are relying on things like Loth, Edgar, Charb and Groom, you know, these are expensive threats and you're not, really getting ahead of curve when you don't have deadly dispute. When you can do like turn three Lolf, it's a very different equation than when you don't have access to that play. You know, not that the play comes up all the time, but just being able to turbo out a game as the mid-range deck, that's sort of the time-tested theory for how you beat a deck that could go over top of you, like find a way to be a little bit faster. This deck struggles a little bit with that. So uh, something like Valky is interesting as a way to challenge Hullbreaker Horror a little more, but there's just so much removal from these as a deck. I, I don't know if it's realistic that that's what you can rely on. And if the is it decks pick up a lot, I don't love this deck's positioning still. I, I think there's other ways to do this type of strategy, but this particular build of uh, Orzov, I'd have some concerns about. Yeah, I mean, they, they could have split. I don't actually know. Sure, but always a possibility. I, I checked, and the fi- both finals are recorded as like 2-0, which like could be a split or could be just a route uh, yeah. with them playing it out. Uh, don't actually know for sure, but I, I think that that's completely within the realm of possibilities. But yeah, I, I agree with everything you said. I think that this deck is very, very good and has some hole breaker or problems. But when you have the capability with like vanishing verse right of oblivion all of your creatures just getting in the way and everything uh i I don't think you necessarily need 
the free win equity from like dispute my shambling gas into like mm-hmm. turbo to loth or whatever. I think that this deck is very good at handling problems and can just play a slower game and be fine in most spots. But yeah, I could see that. I don't know. You if I have shambling gas in my deck, you'd probably have to you know pry deadly dispute from my cold dead hands. Mostly feel the same way. Uh, another new Kamigawa card in the sideboard: Soul Transfer. Not familiar with that one. BB1 Sorcery. It's, choose one. It's good. You control an artifact and an enchantment. As you cast the spell, you may choose both. Exile target creature or planeswalker. Return target creature or planeswalker card from your graveyard to your hand. So a, a real grindy tool for these decks where you can buy back these Sorens or Lolths multiple times and deal with your opponent's best threat because they almost always have the artifact enchantment set up in this deck. So a uh, really powerful addition. Well, you need... Both, right? Right, right. Uh, so you're you're getting the artifact just from Shambling Ghast? There's the Shambling Ghast, there's the Coffin from Edgar, which is an artifact. Oh, okay, okay. Um, that that I one's think, a little trickier, but... Yeah, I, I, I think... I, I guess when you're not playing Deadly Dispute, you're a little bit lighter on the artifacts, that's fair. Yeah. Uh, the enchantment setup is really easy because your Meat Hook Massacres and Wedding Announcements, they generally stay on the battlefield for the most part. Agreed. So maybe not as strong in this particular build of Orzov as it may be in more Deadly Dispute focused ones, but I still think a, a fine addition here. And in the really hard focused ones, it's often going to be a hard two for one. Yeah, I've seen it in Anvil decks because you have artifacts from that and the tokens it makes. And then you have Meat Hook Massacre and then folks who are playing Dockside Chef to yep. also fulfill the enchantment clause. So like, yep. I like Chef a lot. Yeah, uh, I don't. I read your article, but like, okay. <laughs> whatever. It, like, if you need an enchantment because you think that Soul Transfer is really good, I 100% support it, you know? Okay. But yeah, Soul Transfer in mirror match type of scenarios like this, it is super, super strong. I think the creatures that you're getting back are not super relevant in a lot of instances, but like, you know, getting back a Valky or maybe a, a vampire could matter. Yeah, I think buying back to Planeswalkers is where you're really going to pull ahead. Yeah, I agree with that. Uh, third place, another Orzov deck. This one has three Deadly Disputes, two Eye Twitches, four Wedding Announcement, two Meat Hooks, uh, also four copies of Wandering Emperor, one Reckoner Bankbuster, and a Takanuma and I got you. Uh, f- cu- curious additions here. I think Bankbuster has impressed me in these small ball decks. I'm still on board with this card. I was last week. No real reason to get off it in my experience. Wandering Emperor has been more of a mixed bag for me. I've only played it a little bit out of some sideboards I've worked on, and then I've played against it a bunch. And, uh, you know, it has moments with really big blowout potential. Other times it feels sort of, I don't know, it feels lackluster against the other options that are present. You know, Lulth or Sorin. I, I haven't really thought Wandering Emperor has kept pace with those choices, but here we see someone going the full four Wandering Emperor before they even touch a Sorin, only two Lulths, which is fine. You know, five mana is very different from four mana. I don't know. Where, where have you fallen on Wandering Emperor? I think Emperor is good, and Emperor in this deck specifically backs up your mediocre beatdowns to be a pretty efficient threat. And I don't know. I've, I, I do agree that the competition is with Sorin. And I'm not sure how I feel it actually stacks up there. I feel like Soren is probably like the stronger card, but it's also usually better to just like play a mix of things like that. Cause it's like, you don't really want like four Sorens in a ton of no, matchups. No, right? I agree. And so, I would say the same thing about the wandering emperor. I think. Yeah. Yeah. I agree with that. I, th- I think four is just a lot uh, of emperors and would like to see a mix, I suppose. But I do think that emperor fits this archetype pretty well. Okay. Yeah. Just a, uh, another take on, uh, this Orzov archetype. I'd probably have this as like, you know, certainly tier 1.5, probably tier one at this point. I, th- I think it's just a fixture of this format and will do a lot to help keep things sort of trending towards later games as opposed to the early games because you just have a lot of really efficient tools to to challenge your opponent's small creatures. Agreed. Fourth place, Mogged with Jeskai. Four Goldspan Dragon, four Hinata Don Crowned, which makes Magma Opus cost two mana. Yeah, so this is the other deck. I, I Like I said, I've been selective with my crafting, and a lot of my early work was on small ball stuff, uh, Oni Cult Anvil, Wedding Invitation decks, uh, some, some work with the vehicle packages. This is where I was like, okay, 
there's there's something going on here. I want to know more about this deck. Uh, I want to know how efficient this engine actually is. And ultimately, what I come back to is you're just not playing bad cards to do this stuff. You're, you're playing the stuff you want to play. Now, I think that's not entirely true in Mog's case. Mog's making some decisions that I, I don't love, like going to Lorehold Command and Maxing Prismari Command. That feels like it's very much like, oh, I'm playing Hanada. I want to get as much out of it as possible. So Agreed. I don't agree with that. I just want to play the really, really good magic cards that are sort of defining standard for a very long period of time. Goldspan Dragon, you know, you get your Hullbreaker Horror late games, you have a Expressive Iteration, all these just incredible cards. And then you play four Magma Opus, which was sort of proving itself as a very fair card in decks that couldn't play it for two mana. When you do have Hinata and a Magma Opus, it's it's just laughable how powerful your deck becomes. And the version I was playing uh, was one from the other challenge we're going to talk about where it also had Galvanic Iteration. I had a turn where I played three Magma Opuses. Uh, that's that's pretty good. I don't know if you've done that before, but turns out that works. It's a lot. Yeah, uh, the, the output this deck is capable of makes me believe that, again, this can be part of the format. It's just cards that are sort of vulnerable to if is it adapts to them and you play more disdainful strokes and then you do have whole breaker horror you don't want to be the person jamming four mana or god forbid eight mana spells into those type of setups so does this actually supplant that deck i'm not sure i don't know the answer to that question well okay the, the thing is is that hinata makes your interaction only cost one mana and if you get to stick this and with like a negate or a valor stance to protect it, you get to untap mm-hmm. with it. I think mm-hmm. that you can pull ahead very quickly because your your cards are going to be very cheap relative to what your opponent has. And you actually have valor stance to potentially answer Hullbreaker Horror, which I, I think is a big deal. And there's there's only one main and one in the sideboard for this. I, I like playing two stances with Hinata. I think stance also works pretty well with Goldspan Dragon. Where True. it's I mean, it's basically a negate. In, in those instances. So I think that this deck has potential and I put together a, a version of my own on arena and decided I did not want to craft the Hinata's. Okay. Uh, that was, that was the only card I was missing. So only a rare, come on. It's like, it's a mythic. No, the dude, the rare wild cards are rarer than mythic wild cards. Yeah. I usually contest that point, but that is now also the situation I'm at. So yeah, I, buddy. I feel you. Yep. yep. Yeah, you craft a bunch of bank busters and, and mind yep. lake mechs and Mukatai soul mm, rippers and Yeah, that's it. You're out. You're out of wild cards. Plus, you know, I don't even get to play with like Igonjo in my deck, because I'm not gonna spend a wild card on that. So Wow, real budget player these days. Yeah, man. I, I think this deck is good. I, I agree with you. I don't really like Lorehold command. Prismari command is fine. If Four people, copies is a lot though. Like, yeah, if, if people are playing like more vehicles, more anvil stuff like that, it's good. I, I like the fact that you can like command on tap play Hinata with the treasure open to protect it. Mm-hmm. But unlike Lorehold Command, you're not getting a bunch of use out of the mana reduction. So it's, right. it's kind of like why is this even here in such high numbers? I don't know. But if you're gonna play Magma Opus, have a backup plan besides Hinata. And I, I like playing Goldspan Dragon in these decks for that reason. Plus, it gives you like more flying threats and everything. So same, and I, I have no beef with Unexpected Windfall too. I think you can just ramp up yes. to Magma Opus and have it be quite good. So. Yeah, my list had all three. Yep, same. Fifth place, Lavunga Twenty One, another Orzov deck. This one with two Soul Transfer, two Bank Buster. Good way to uh, yeah, yeah. Do, do the artifact clause. One Iganja, one Emperor. This one has all the Deadly Disputes. Seven learn creatures, two meat hooks, uh, two law, two Soren with with one emperor. So like not not a ton of planeswalkers. I I think this is the list I like the most out of all of the Orzov list that we've talked about so far. Just in terms of balance, in terms of like spreading out your planeswalkers a bit, being able to play a lot of different game plans. If you ask me to choose one, this would be the one I would choose. Yeah, I mostly agree. I think one Edgar is is a little low, but I guess that's another card kind of competing in that planeswalkery spot. Yep, no, that's a fine way to look at it. Uh, sixth place, Ale Milan 19, Esper Control. Making good use of like Path Apparel, have Edgar for blocks, two Leer, one Hallbreaker Horror, also some Planeswalkers, two Soren, two Lolf, but more of a, a blue component, I guess, for Jawari Disruption, Memory Deluge, Bolden Multiverse. Like, not, not a lot of good counter magic. To really be playing you know like divide by zero would kind of fill those slots right fill that role 
It did. So you're you're playing like a bunch of blue cards instead of the small shambling gas learn package. I think I like the creatures better. I do too, although I could see a moment where the blue cards are what you want. It, it, it all depends on what the format is doing around it. I think at this moment in the format, I certainly prefer the small creatures. I'm also surprised to see Lear still getting some run. I I never really believed in Lear outside of Divide by Zero. It always seemed like you just had to lean on that card for it to actually matter. And um, I, I don't know. Maybe you could talk me into one copy. Two seems like a lot, though, for this particular setup even if it is a good source of card advantage, because you just have so many other ways to do that. You have your Behold the Multiverse, you have your Planeswalkers. I, investing into a card that sort of is a lightning rod for any removal your opponent may be playing, of which they should have some. I mean, there should be some way for them to interact with this card. Don't really love it here. Yeah, I mostly agree with you. Like, Lear is good when Fading Hope is really good. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and there are two copies of Fading Hope here, but... Like you said, maybe not the moment for that card, exactly. Yep. Gracias, Portanto, seventh place. Gruel to besage you once again in, as new cards. Oh, I guess this is Teamer. I have some one disdainful stroke, one negate with uh, Jasper Sentinel, Magda, Goldspan, Dragon package. I don't have much to add about this deck. I think it's sort of in the same state as it was, ob- obviously. But you can tell by the uh, sort of absence of many new cards. I'm not sure it was great. Previously, I I think there's better ways to play the powerful cards in these decks. Like if you want to be a Goldspan Dragon deck, there's better Goldspan Dragon decks. Uh, if you want to do Magda stuff, I think you can find better ways to do just Spara Sentinel Magda stuff, uh, particularly some of the newer builds focused around the other accelerants we have, like Moosnare Prototype are appealing to me in that sort of field. So I'm just not in love with this deck, and I'm not sure who it's targeting at this moment. Same. Uh, Idea 29, eighth place, mono white aggro, three Wandering Emperor's main, and two Iconjos. What do you think of the Wandering Emperor as an aggressive card? Because that's essentially what it's being asked to do here. I I think it's fine in a deck that leans mid range, but this deck, I would want to keep everything three mana or less. Yeah, I'm surprised to see the curve go up that high. I sort of wish if that's what we were trying to do, we would do it with some more modal cards, I guess. Like, I I just don't know that this deck is actually reaching that mana threshold. I've, I've played a lot of mono white aggro and asking it to routinely produce four mana seems like a lot, especially for a card that isn't like super backbreaking in the aggro scenarios you're trying to impress upon your opponent. Like, it, it's good. Uh, don't get me wrong. It does a lot of things really well. It just, it's, it's not particularly polarized. It's sort of a jack of all trades. Yeah. And I feel like you want more polarized cards for this deck. Yeah, I would be more interested in just playing like a fourth Thalia, fourth Adeline, things to keep your aggro game plan consistent. I guess without Faceless Haven, maybe you need more maybe. things in, yeah. in, the, in the line of like mana sinks or whatever, but I don't, I don't think that Emperor is it really. Yeah, even, even if that's what I was looking for, you could still make a case for like Legion Angel, which is a card that I also don't love yeah. in these decks. I would, I would it, much rather play like two Legion Angels. If you were to ask me Emperor or Legion Angel, that that is where I would lie for this archetype. Yeah. Uh, do you want to cover the top 16? Like, No, let's let's move to the next challenge. Unless there's something specifically you want to talk about in the top 16, anything that really caught your eye. A lot um, of mono green as you start scrolling down through this standard challenge just outside of the top eight. So that's interesting. Yeah, I got a, a Jund Magda deck, but with no Jasper Sentinel. That's weird. Some more Orzov decks, another Hinata deck. Yeah, I don't know. I'm off it. Okay. Yeah, th- what I want to talk about is going to show up uh, in our next standard challenge. So I'm fine going All right. just on to the next one. Second standard challenge, February 13th. Uh, again, won by Is It. Second place, Willie Adel, Mono Red. Is this what you want to talk about or no? Yes. Okay. Yeah, I, I love this mono red deck. I love this version of mono red. Uh, I, I think Willie's list also looks quite strong to me. We blew it having Lizard Blades as our mm. uh, reconfigure yes. representative. Yes and no. So you, you brought up the fact that like Rabbit Battery might be more ubiquitous. And I mostly agreed with you. But like the red cards were so hard because it's like, well... What what is doing the most work here? What is going to show up in in the most spots? Maybe, and it seemed like Blizzard Blades could maybe show up in in more decks, even if Rabbit Battery is like more of a backbone, more of a better card, whatever. And 
I, just so many of these red cards. Are, like this, this deck has twenty new cards, and it's not even you know necessarily playing all the new cards that I think it should be playing. So I, I don't know. I, I think the card is good. I think we knew it was good, and yeah, maybe should have made that change. But I, I really don't think it's a big difference. You're you're kind to yourself, and I am. You're right that like they're similar in function. It's just. Ogre Head Helm, Rabbit Battery are very much the backbone of what you're doing here, getting further support from Thunder and Raju. Kamanu faces Kakazan. I, I have enjoyed that card. It's kind of outperformed my expectations. It's uh, sort of busted. Yeah, and I, I feel that way about the the black card that makes a 2-2 as well. Or you're just getting, no. again, no, yeah. I like that card a lot, especially where, like, Reckoner Bankbuster is such a good card in those small ball decks. Like, you get such a good return on giving those things menace. Yeah, that's fair. I don't know. I, I guess this one isn't as hardcore into the uh, modified stuff. Like, it's not playing Kami's Flare. Mm-hmm. Which, which, is, I, which I'm surprised. I, I like Kami's Flare quite a bit. You know, the choice to play Royal Eruption, I sort of get it. But I think I would make the swap just from my, my play preferences. Yeah, I mean, Komodo faces Kakazan just makes that so trivial. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? It, it, that, that's just one of the reasons why I like the card so much is, like, you just get basically like a free counter when you wouldn't expect it and putting on your two drop means that it's probably going to be able to attack unimpeded for at least a couple turns. It with lizard blades is very good. Great you know? with lizard blades. Yeah. So I, I, I do like the Kamano card a lot. I also just like playing Kami's flare and I've also experimented with some red decks that just like didn't even play Raiju and we're just like super low to the ground, like mm-hmm. pat- patchwork automaton decks, which is yeah, yeah. a card that I think, these red decks should be exploring. They should be playing with. Interesting. One of the other things I love about what Willie's done is just moving the Chandras to the main deck. I, I had them in my sideboard. And then as soon as I saw this, I was like, why did I have this card in my sideboard? Like it, it should just be clearly in my main deck. It's fantastic, especially given how low you've pushed the mana curve, uh, how much this deck benefits from getting a little bit more length. Although Ogre Head Helm also does a really great job of instilling that sort of burst into your late game where you're able to turn that into some more cards and in particular it's play alongside rabbit battery has come up so much for me where i'm just like empty board oh no actually here's three damage and also i've refilled my hand out of nowhere so so helm is one of those cards where it it reads like it could be kind of weak but i like the ability and like the effect like the you know any sort of like ox of a gonus bedlam reveler type thing like has my attention Mm-hmm. And so I was like, I'm pretty sure this is a card that I like that everyone else is going to think sucks. But like in practice, it'll probably be kind of hard to connect or it'll be like two man intensive or whatever. So uh, it's showing up here at four copies is like kind of surprising to me. And I don't know. I just I feel like the world would think that it is it is worse than just jamming like, you know, four overhead helms, two lizard bleeds. Right. Like that's wild to me. It is, but I started to drift the same way in my mono red decks because I, you know, you only have to connect a couple times with Ogre Head Helm. Also, like moving it around matters a bunch, and you realize it's expensive hard. though. It is, it is, but at the state of the game where you're trying to benefit from that, that's sort of where you're at, right? Like you've established your mana base, your opponent has found some way to blunt your offense, and you need a way to rebuild and. The red decks were really lacking that before. It was all on the back of Faceless Haven, and you just weren't as good of a Faceless Haven deck as the other monocolored aggro. I think with this adaptation of mono red towards these builds, th- this is now the best monocolored aggro deck. I think it's already supplanted mono white and mono green in my eyes, which is a, a huge change from the way the last format worked. It got a ton of cards from the new set. 20 new cards in the main deck here, and that's, that's huge. You're not going to see that for the rest of this discussion. And, so. and I already think that they could be playing more. You know, yeah, I, 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 believe I, I think that Kami Flare is solid. I think that you could play Simeon Sling over Voldaire and Epicure if you wanted to. Mm-hmm. Uh, again, Patchwork Automaton type of stuff. That that way you can get your crappy little Ronin guy in there. Yeah, sure. <laughs> uh, third place, Bill's Live, Jess Guy, Hinata, now with an Otawara, Soaring City. So five new cards, big game. Uh, this one, a little bit different. One Galvanic Iteration, a Disdainful Stroke, a Demon Bolt, uh, three Prismari Commands, three Unexpected Windfalls, no Lore Hold Commands. Just This looks like more of a traditional Jeskai deck that happens yep. to have Hinata in it, rather yep. than a thing that's just like, I am all in on Hinata. 
And I, I like that approach. This is when I started working on this archetype, this is the list I worked off of because I thought it was the best built out of all of them. Just seems like it's, it's emphasizing the game plan without losing its mind over it and still hanging on to the other things that make this archetype so powerful. We mentioned unexpected windfall, gold span dragon. You, you're just going to cast some magma opuses when you're playing four of them. I think it's very important to preserve that angle of play. And the card is just super powerful. Even when you're paying eight mana, I think like you get a fair return for your eight mana when you pay two, it's preposterous. So I really like this particular setup for the Hanada decks. Six on the Swiss uh, eventually lost to Willie Adel's Water Red deck. Three three for Mari commands, where I guess this is the matchup where the fourth would have been pretty good, huh? Yeah, it, w- it would have been. And you you know, you look at the cards present here and you're like, well, you, you have all the tools. If there's one thing missing, it's maybe like the, the sweeper package is just Cinderclasm, which is okay, but also those red decks are really good at playing around sweepers, so they do a nice job if they use their reconfigure properly of, yeah. of pushing through damage, so that's a problem these decks are going to have to figure out an answer to. Getting to play Rabbit Battery against sweepers is some of the most fun I've had. Oh, yeah. I love Rabbit Battery as a card. I think it's so cool. King Harry, fourth place. Azorius uh, Control. Weird. Uh, 17 new cards, three Farewells, four Spirited Companion, two of each Legendary Land, four March of Otherworldly Light, and two Wandering Emperors. Also with two Hullbreaker Horrors. I have to actually read Witness the Future. What the hell is this? Is this a new card too? No, this is, uh, I, I think it's the the card draw card from the, the link, Haven. The, the link together or whatever doesn't actually work. It, it, the, link, the link is down, yep. <laughs> what so does it do? Gonna, hold on, hold on. No, this is an Innistrad card. Uh, this is two colorless blue sorcery target player shuffles up to four target cards from their graveyard oh, into no. their library. You look at the top four cards of your library, then put one of those cards into your hand and the rest on the bottom of your library in a random order. Gaze Blessing Impulse? Yeah, just going, going real long here. And you don't- some of the other cards included... Like, I don't. I don't hate that idea. I, I actually, uh, obviously, I love the idea. Of I know, but you don't need forever. to with Hallbreaker Horror. The game is going to end before that right. matters. That's what I was going to say. Some of the other inclusions don't like. If you were just like a weird farewell deck, and you're like, I'll eventually kill my opponent with Spirited Companions. That's weird, but like, okay, I I get what you're going for. When you're a Hallbreaker Horror deck, though, it, it doesn't really make much sense to me. Yeah. So a lot of new cards. Is Spirited Companion actually good? Does it actually do anything here? In this deck, I don't understand it. Uh, just straight up, I don't understand it. In other decks, it's been quite good for me. I, th- I think it's a great. Yeah, no, it's, not, it's card. obviously a good card, but uh, here you're just like looking to draw a card and make a chump block. I don't, I don't really know. The deck's already playing three revitalize, so this is just revitalizes four through seven. I guess so. I guess so. I wasn't sure I wanted the first three, but sure, <laughs> I, I guess line them up. I guess so. When you have Hullbreaker Horror, right? Like the problem is potentially running out of gas. So. Witness the future to some degree, like keeps your deck chock full of spells. You have these cantrips that allow you to chain off with Hullbreaker Horror, so that's nice too. So I kind of get the idea of just like two mana cantrip that like kind of does something. Mm -hmm. At least if you're finding that that is an issue, which I mean, it could be. I don't know if I buy it, but I mean, especially alongside like March of the Otherworldly Light, which is sort of pushing you in the other direction where you're like, I'm okay giving up a card to be able to do this effect. And granted, like it, it's modal, so you're not always yeah. giving up a card, but just so a weird combination of cards here. But I do think like it's worth noting that the combination of Azorius cards in a controlling shell, there's a lot of options and yes, they seem good. You can, you can play good, solid game plans with uh, these decks. So there, there are also like artifact versions of, of this type of mm-hmm. stuff. So mm-hmm. yeah, definitely a lot of options. This is probably not where my brain would have went, to build around, but but farewell is definitely a very powerful card. Like you, yes, it is playing against like the wedding announcement type stuff, and it's pretty nice to have a card like that. Agreed, and it may have actually been a missing piece piece for the pure control decks, but like just build a pure control deck then, which I I don't think this is. This is kind of towing the line, and you know I love my very uh, linear type approaches. So, dude, I played a team event with you when you were playing like the do nothing blue eye control deck. Mm. Good times yeah. for me. Yeah. Uh, Shatoon, fifth place. Uh, Hinata deck. This one with the lore hold commands and everything. So don't need to talk about that. Nope. Sixth place, McWin Sauce. Another Hinata deck. 
McQuinn Sauce's decks are always a, a little bit weird, but like not yeah. not in a bad way, you know. This one's going a little harder for sure. Uh, March of Swirling Mist, which is the phase out X creatures. I've seen that with Hinata is like another weird kind of protection spell slash fog or whatever. And it's like kind of lore hold commandy to me, where it's like you certainly would not play this card just on its own merit. It's just like oh, it works kind of well with Hinata, but is that even good? Who knows. Inscription of Insight. When I saw this, I was like, oh, is this like busted with Hinata? It's just like, no, not really. Nope. <laughs> it's like just okay and is pretty bad without it. So don't necessarily like that either. But when you do have Hinata, you're definitely firing on all cylinders. Like you don't necessarily need Opus at that point because the rest of your cards are doing a lot of stuff too. Yeah, I, I'll just go back to the same point. I don't think you have to try this hard. I, I don't hate March of Swirling Mist, though. I actually think that has just potential as a good card. It sort of needs a deck that can really use all of its pieces and and benefit from all it offers. Like, I, I want something which has a little bit more early aggression. And I think back to mono blue decks and this card just being like a one of or a two of in those decks would have been very interesting to me. Really good at pushing damage, almost impossible to race in some scenarios. You get to both advance your battlefield and then on your opponent's turn, basically wrath them and remove all their black blockers, even if you spent mana, provided you have enough resources. And I think that's a really interesting thing for decks to have access to. Just I don't know that I buy it alongside Hinata. You just don't have to. You don't have to try this hard. Yeah. Lenny, seventh place. Uh, is it Dragons? One Atsushi, two Otawara, one Hallbreaker Horror, four Smoldering Egg, four Goldsman Dragon. And then kind of what you would just expect between, you know, blue and red cards, the kill stuff, draw cards. Yep. Only I would just play more Hallbreaker Horror. I think you're just, the, the Atsushi, I understand wanting to play it, but if this was just a second Hallbreaker Horror, I would like this deck way more. But the Dragon's Fires, Brian. Think of the I Dragon's know. Fires. It, it'll be okay. Dragonfire is still a fine card. Eighth place, Guldkot, Mono, Green, Aggro, four Invoke the Ancients, two Reckoner Bankbuster, one Besaju who endures. For now, cards. Invoke the Ancients, That's our. is that our quasi Verderous Gearhulk, or am I confusing that with the white version? The white one. This one uh, makes two four fives, and then you put a choice of Vigilance, Reach, or Trample counter on them. Interesting. Interesting. Well, that's, that's a lot of stuff. For five mana. Yeah, I would have to think more about that card. I'm, I'm not repulsed by it. I could see the flexibility of its, you know, modality. It, obviously, like four or five Vigilance can be really good in some spots. Four or five Reach Creature lines up very well with all the dragons that are around. Trample means it's hard to throw Wedding Invitation stuff in front of it. So. Yeah, that's what I was going to mention. Yeah, I, I kind of see it. I don't know if it's the best choice at five mana, but I'm, I'm at least interested. And then... Our homie Reckoner Bankbuster showing up to add just a little card draw to the Model Green archetype. Excellent card. Also pretty easy to crew in Werewolf Pack Leader deck. So oh, yeah. It's pretty yeah, nice. A lot, of, a lot of big bodies here. Yeah. Uh, I mean, this deck has four Sculptor of Winter, two Jasper Sentinel to also accelerate into Invoke the Ancients a little bit. So I, I kind of get it. I'm not super excited by it, you know, but it seems... It, it seems solid no matter what. You're getting eight power for five mana spread across two bodies. And in some matchups, it's like I, I can see how people could just never beat it, you know? Mm hmm. Sure. Well, I think that does it for our top eight. Anything in this top 16 that you want to point to that you find interesting? Or, you know, what do you, what do you make of the absence of things like Oni Cult Anvil? You know, I know you've been high on vehicle based strategies. Mind Link Mech was our, our number one card. And, and in playing, it sort of has lived up to my expectations. Like you got to work around it, but I, I think the card's been excellent and it's just a complete blank here in this. Yeah. It just, you know. it, it's hard. It doesn't fit into every single deck. You know, it's, it's right. definitely not like chariot. You definitely have to work for it. I think that the recent stuff that I have done has leveled it up quite a bit. And I'm kind of eager to like actually get in the challenges and, and battle people because I, I want to see if, you know, how highly I think of the deck is like actually accurate or not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I would love to see you up against the Zoomers. Uh, I am also excited for you to do the same thing. I will, I will happily bird your play. Can I can I just and, run uh, the simulation, I guess? like. Well, see, that's what I have you for. Is you, you are essentially my simulation as you go through this event and I get to watch and just see how it turns out. Yeah, but I want to... I want to I wanna be you in the scenario. I want to have someone else do it for me. 
Well, maybe you shouldn't be so good at magic, Jerry. Next lifetime, you'll have to address Ugh. that. Uh, there are some mind link max in this top 32. Okay. You found some. Yeah, but it's, it's in like a calamity bearer deck, but, but they're mm-hmm. there. Uh, you know, someone's playing them. It's cool. Yeah. If, if you go down deeper, there are some more weirdo cards. You see like a, a Kaido showing up. Uh, there's, there's cards that I have to Google as we go through the top 32. So people are working on this stuff. I, I'm seeing a bunch of moon snare prototypes as we get further down. So love to see that card showing up. I, I still believe in that. All my experience playing it leads me to it's <laughs> say it's it's very good. Yep. Uh, so it feels like it's only a matter of time until this stuff starts to intrude on the standard space, uh, assuming that there isn't a hard limiter on the format. And when I think of what that could possibly be, it it's still a holebreaker horror. That's still the card I fear taking the most wind out of this format. Sales. I tell you, man, that plays out. Playing playing as a vehicles is like you have. All these sources of card advantage, you know, like Tezzeret, Bankbuster, whatever. And you have pretty solid answers to things, especially after sideboarding. Mm-hmm. And then it's like you're playing this nice game and then they play a whole breaker horror and you're like, oh, yeah. And nothing matters. It invalidates every turn that came before it. Yeah, it just means that I need to be like more conscientious of sneaking in damage when I can and not necessarily like playing to the card advantage game or the long game. Mm. So a little bit more reach in these archetypes maybe does it for you? Uh, I mean, th- that would be nice. It's just it's not super doable, right? It's like there's not like sh- shrapnel blasty type of stuff. The burn spells mm. are like a royal eruption. Voltage surge is very good, so you kind of have to play that yep. over yep. the other burn spells. It's basically just like, you know, rabbit battery based beatdowns. I guess like lizard blades is a thing where it can create like a pretty quick turnaround. I had some games like that the other day that were pretty nice. but uh, Yeah, hopping in the mind like mech, always nice. Yeah, one of them, I don't know. I just, I played, I played like two matches two days ago or whatever. And it was just like all that I could weave in in between like packing and stuff when I was writing this, this is a vehicles article. And both of the matches were like, we're, we're pretty even, we're trading. And then just something happens around turn like five, six, seven, where I'm like kind of behind. But then over the course of, of two turns, it, it, I just go from like nothing to 20 damage, you know? Mm-hmm. Uh, so those those scenarios are kind of what give me hope because you couldn't really do that with any deck before. You know, it's like if you were mono green or mono white and they kind of like dealt with your board, just like pack it in. Yeah, no, that's a good point. Uh, there is a lot of ability to rebuild baked into this set. I, I mean, I still just like I, I like I said, I don't want to even acknowledge the whole breaker store horror stuff at the top of these challenges because I'm having such a good time playing these decks, testing these decks. Like it does feel like standard has moved forward in a meaningful way. It It's just that I have this point of fear and I hope that I'm proven wrong. Yeah, really it's, it's fine. I mean, if, if no one plays standard, then it doesn't matter, right? Well, that's one way of looking at it. And then we could say none of this matters. So Sh- Schrodinger's whole breaker horror. Right. Uh, thankfully, most people are only playing like one, right? So like rarely comes up. But when it does come up, I'm like, oh yeah, that's still a card, damn it. That's a good sign. They should be playing more than one, I think. I know, I know. But also, I'm, I'm playing a, a deck that doesn't really exist currently. So Sure, fair enough. Who cares? That's game. <laughs> Can we end every show like that from now on? Yeah. Who cares? That's game. Good luck.